I, in the book of Jude, <laughs> it occurs just before the last book of the Bible, just before Revelation. How many chapters does it have? <laughs> There's one chapter. Sometimes I pull a sneaky and try to embarrass somebody by saying, turn to Jude chapter 2 and when they're thumbing through it, then I say, well, there's only one chapter in Jude, but I decided not to do that tonight. <laughs> Try to be a little kinder. Jude, verse uh, 22 and 23 will be our text. Sound like the kids in Master Club's having a good time back there, doesn't it? Jude 22 and 23. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Father, we pray that you'd bless us tonight as we study in the Word. Lord, I pray that you'd make it near and dear to our heart. Lord, help us to have a change in our own ways of thinking, and which leads to our a change in our own way of action. We pray that you'd bless us and lead us with the Holy Spirit of God tonight as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a teenager, grew up in Nizard County and a little town of Mount Pleasant where I went to high school. I think our whole town was like a population of, of 300. And so you can imagine about how big the high school was. Oh, well, our high school, grade school, there wasn't any such thing in those days as uh, kindergarten in our neck of the woods. It was just first grade through 12th. And uh, so we had a pretty small school. But as a teenager, we would, we would go places to do things. And uh, there wasn't much to do up there. And as, I mean, Izzard County is one of the most sparsely populated counties in the whole state. But there was a, there was a place where we would gather at times called Conyers Spring. Conyers Spring was about three miles out of the little town. And there at Conyers Spring, teenagers would gather. We gathered there to uh, have a place of our own, a place out from under the watchful, prying eyes of those who expected us to do right. <laughs> and so we'd hide out at Conyers Spring as a group. Sometimes there'd be three or four cars parked out there. There's a large turning around place where you had room to to park, you could turn around and, uh, and, and just gather. We'd just get outside the cars and talk and, and carry on and act goofy like teenagers do. And uh, Conyers Spring was a, was a neat little place. And <coughs> on the, the spring, you know, it was like a, a little artesian well boiling up through white sand coming up to the surface of the ground. And around it was built a, a square concrete box about this big. And on the ledge, it was, it was probably up about this high off the ground, that ledge was, and the, that little concrete square tank would fill up with that water and then run out through a spout through the side. And it's full of cold, crystal clear water. And on the edge of that tank sat an old Campbell soup can, and labeled long gone. And that old soup can was there so anybody who came by could get a cool drink of water. And there wasn't a lot of places to get a cool drink of water. I mean, no convenience stores around. And back then, if there was a convenience store, they didn't even keep bottled water. I mean, in those days, we thought, we thought it would be ridiculous for anybody to ever try to sell water. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so if you got a chance to go out by the spring, if you were just traveling by and it's hot and dusty in the summertime, man, you pull over at that spring, you're hot, you're sweaty, you're dry. Nobody had air conditioning in those days. Very, very few people had indoor uh, running water. And so we'd stop at that spring and, and get a, take that old Campbell's soup can, dip it up, and get a cold drink of water. Everybody drank out of the same can. But now, don't snicker. That water was probably purer than what you drank out of your faucet today. Even though everybody else who maybe had tobacco juice running down their chin was drinking out of that same old can. <laughs> and we were inoculated against everything. I mean, we were, we were immunized. And so it wasn't always a teenage hangout. In earlier days, the homesteaders, because of lack of refrigeration and running water, uh, water especially cool, fresh, clear water was a valuable asset and people from miles around would drive their horse and buggy, covered wagon or whatever 
and they'd bring in their cans, uh, milk cans, usually a milk can, you've seen them probably at antique stores. Now there are milk cans about this big, look like a galvanized can. Might have been stainless steel, I'm not sure. I think it's galvanized. <laughs> probably just wonder if we hadn't died from drinking out of those. And had a steel uh, lid on the top of it. People would haul their cream cans over there and fill them up with fresh cold water and haul it home. And, and that's what the, their water supply was. So uh, water was a very scarce commodity and people settled along the creek banks and river banks for that reason because they needed water and but people people used Conyers Spring right up until the mid 60s maybe up into the 80s uh, even when I was a teenager in the 50s and 60s they would uh, people would go there and haul water still yet and so water was a valuable commodity <coughs> and so is the water of life. Jesus told the woman at the well what she needed was the water that he could supply. The water that would spring up inside into a well of life. A springing well of life. He's talking about being born again, being a Christian, being saved and having eternal life. Having at that point become a child of God and they would have that water in them. Now I'm going to focus on these two verses out of Jude just for a moment. We're going to have two parts to our message tonight. We're not uh, doing the uh, <coughs> we're not doing the uh, where saints have trod tonight. Uh, we're sticking with at least for a while. We're going to be sticking with the instruction about winning people to Jesus Christ, and because we're emphasizing missions this month. And I think it would be beneficial for us to gain instruction about leading people towards the Savior as well as sending people around the world to be missionaries. And so tonight we're going to take just a couple of minutes and do a, an outline from this passage of Scripture, the two verses we just read in Jude. Jude, this will be our academic outline. <laughs> and then we're going to go into practical instruction after that, let me give you the first thing. Look, look at that verse again that we read out of uh, Jude chapter 1. We're not going to chapter 2. Jude 1, verse 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Why does he say of some have compassion? Are we not to have compassion on the others? And others save with fear. Are we not trying to, try to get everybody saved? Pulling them out of the fire. Well, and the Bible teaches that there is an eternal place as opposed to heaven. There is a place of fire. And when someone is not saved, they haven't made a conscious decision to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, then they're still on the path to the fire. And we are to snatch them from the flames, as it were, and set them on the road to heaven if the Holy Spirit sees fit. Hating the garment, even the garment spotted by flesh. Three things notice out of these two verses. First of all is selection. We're going to talk about selection, compassion, and alteration. I wanted them all three to end with a T-I-O-N, and so that's what we're calling them. Selection, compassion, and alteration. Number one, selection. Uh, this whole little book of Jude is talking about the apostates who have taken the gospel of Christ and turned it inside out and upside down and perverted it and tell you that there's a different way to get saved, there's a different way to heaven besides Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And so the subject is the apostates in Jude. And so if someone, listen, if someone is so much of an apostate, they have turned from the they have turned from the Lord. They have turned against them. They're atheists or maybe skeptics or maybe just God-haters. Uh, if, if they have become apostate, they do not believe or appreciate or use the gospel of Christ. They are apostate. And when somebody has crossed that line where they're not willing to listen to you, tell them about the Savior, then he said, don't. Basically, you're not supposed to waste your time trying to force feed somebody that doesn't want it. You can't twist anybody's arm and make them get saved. And so that's the selection, making a difference, understanding the difference between an apostate and someone who has a tender, teachable 
heart. If someone is an apostate and he says, don't tell me anything, I don't want to know anything about the Bible, anything about the Lord, leave me alone. Then go to somebody who has a tender heart, a teachable heart, and give the gospel to them, making a difference, having the wisdom <clears throat> to know where to spend your time. And then not only selection, but compassion. Apply mercy and love and concern for those who are willing to hear the gospel. Those who are in danger of fire, love them to Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, not only selection and compassion, but alteration. Notice in that verse that he talks about making a difference. And then he says, save with fear. Well, what's the Christian supposed to fear about telling somebody about Jesus? Well, we are to fear being soiled by the sinfulness of the world as we go out to tell others. In other words, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into a nightclub where the music is wild and the fornication is rampant and the booze is flowing freely and sit at a table with everybody who is engaged in that kind of behavior in order to try to find somebody to witness to. In other words, don't become spotted by the world, the sinfulness of the world. And that's our command from Christ that we're supposed to uh, avoid the sinfulness. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect or that we're going to be holier than thou, but it does mean that we're supposed to avoid being spotted by the world. In other words, if we're going to get people saved, we can't be just like the lost world. There has to be something to allure them to Christ. We have to be able to tell them, look, Jesus did something great for me. I used to be a drunk. I used to be a dope head. I used to be an adulterer. I used to be a fornicator. I used to be a thief. But God came along and saved me and changed me. And if they can't see that change, they're probably not interested in what you've got. Well, alteration. That just simply means that when you get saved, you're supposed to be different than you were before you got saved. <laughs> different. I mean, there was a, I'm not all I ought to be, for sure. But thank God I'm not what I used to be before I met Christ. Well, let's look at one other verse before we go into the practical applications now. Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. We have it on the screen if you don't have there in your Bible. But you shall receive power. This is Jesus talking to his disciples just before he goes back to heaven after his resurrection. He says, but ye, disciples, shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's, that's what the missionaries do is take the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth. But what about Jerusalem and Judea? Well, that's up to us. We send the missionaries out, but we're supposed to get the gospel out here simultaneously while they're doing it over there. And he says that we will receive the power to do what he's instructed us to do. Our emphasis here at Liberty Baptist Church is to make sure everybody has an opportunity to hear the gospel. Everybody ought to hear. It doesn't mean everybody that hears will get saved, but we want to try to make sure that everybody gets a chance to hear the gospel. I was thinking back when this a few years ago, uh, Aaron had preached and... Uh, given the gospel in his message and Carson, Joey's nephew, got, uh, he got concerned about the need to be saved. Well, you know what Joey did? After he found out that Carson was troubled about it and was wondering about salvation, Joey got in his car and drove to his sister's house and told Carson the whole story about how to be saved. And Carson listened and he trusted the Lord as his Savior. Aren't you glad that when people hear, they have the opportunity to get saved? Somebody waters, somebody plants seed, somebody waters, and somebody else makes the harvest. And that's the way it works. And I'm excited about what the Lord is doing here at Liberty Baptist Church. Last Sunday, a young man, uh, 32 years old, 
uh, trusted the Lord as Savior after the church service was over on Resurrection Sunday. And I'm excited about what the Lord is doing here. We had people saved all along through the years and people baptized and, and learning to live for Christ. And so we're speaking again tonight on the subject of witnessing and winning people to Jesus Christ. And here, here's one part of the pastor's job description. You know, everybody's got a job description, right? And so part of my job description as pastor is in Ephesians 4, 11, verse number 12. And he, Jesus, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And now he's named these people that he has put, that Jesus has put into the ministry and gifted them. And then he says in verse 12, for the perfecting or the equipping of the saints. What is a pastor supposed to do? He's supposed to perfect, equip, instruct. For what reason? For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, two things happens there. First is to equip the saints. Part of the pastor's job is to equip the saints, to equip the saints to be able to do ministry. And then part of that is, number two, to edify the saints. Now, we're supposed to do two different things. In our preaching in our ministry in our personal lives as Christians we're supposed to do two different things number one we're supposed to give out the gospel in our ministry and then edify the saints we're supposed to give the gospel to the lost and then edify the saints so the lost person gets saved and becomes a saint and then once the person is saved and becomes the saint then he is to be edified according to that passage of scripture he's to be he's to be equipped for the work of the ministry you know something? Everybody in this room tonight is a minister, if you're saved. You are a minister, and you, you have a message to deliver. You have a work to do. You have a job, and your job is to help get people get saved, and your job is to help build up the saints. You know, we can encourage one another, but we don't spend all of our time just encouraging one another. Part of the time, we ought to encourage one another to go out there and win the lost to Christ. And so part of our job as Christians is to build each other up in the faith. But then as we get strengthened, we're supposed to go out and win others to the Lord. Those are two important parts of the ministry of the saints, to win lost souls and strengthen the believers. We have, in my opinion, we have one of the best memberships that our church has ever had. I believe we got a great group of people right now, perhaps the best ever, I don't know. Because we got people who are joyful, people who are willing to work, people who are willing to give, people who are willing to be loyal and faithful. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that honestly, not just to butter your toast, I'm saying I believe we have a very good group of people right now, maybe the best we've ever had in this church. And since... Since we're on the road to serving God together, it becomes necessary to be reminded of our responsibility and gain instructions on winning the lost because we don't want it to stop with us three and no more. <laughs> or no, it's us four and no more, isn't it? Got to make it rhyme. Well, this message that we're going into now, the practical part, is about equipping with simple ways to get the gospel to other people. Are you with me? Nod your head so I know you're awake. Okay. This is going to be a teaching session. I'm not going to be swinging from the chandelier, shouting and running and stomping and spitting, thundering, lightning and all that. I'm just going to teach. This is a Wednesday night service. Sometimes we, even though we may have the best membership that we've ever had, sometimes if we're not careful, friends, we can get comfortable with what God has done for us and say, well, we have arrived. <laughs> I can just sit back and switch on the autopilot and just enjoy my Christianity. Ah, right. oh, that's a dangerous place to be. Right. And sometimes we get so comfortable we forget that we're supposed to be busy winning people to the Lord and getting people saved. And we talk about church growth and we don't want to grow just so we can say we've got all the chairs full. 
what we want is people to be saved because that means they belong to Christ. They've been born into the family of God. And as they grow and become edified, they'll fill up these chairs. But sometimes if we get a little distant from our mission of winning the lost, sometimes we just need to be reminded. I'm guilty as anybody else. Sometimes I just get comfortable and I think, boy... You know, we've just got a great church, and we've got great music, and we've got great classes, and we've just got everything going good. The Lord's good to us. He's answering prayers, and we're seeing some people, you know, follow the Lord, and that's good. And then we just we kind of need to be reminded once again to be brought back to the point where we're consciously trying to see people saved. We have to be reminded, kind of like the, the preacher, the Baptist preacher was walking down the street, and he saw... A little boy out in the yard had a lawnmower sitting there and had a for sale sign on it. And, and uh, the preacher was needing a lawnmower. So he stopped by and he said, how much is that lawnmower, son? He said, it's $25. He said, does it run? He said, yes, sir. It'll start and run. And the preacher said, man, that's a pretty good price. I'm just going to buy it. And so he pulled $25 out and gave it to the little boy. And he pushed it back over into his yard next door. What hot summer day. I mean, he, it was sweltering hot. And that preacher reached down and thought he'd go ahead and mow his yard. And he reached down and pulled on that rope. It didn't start. He pulled on the rope again. It still didn't start. Man, he pulled and he pulled and he pulled. And he's sweating, streaming, running off of his face. He looked over in the yard. That little boy was watching him. He said, son, I thought you said it would start and run. The little boy said, it will. you just got to cuss it. Preacher said, son, I'm a Baptist preacher. I've been saved so long I've forgotten how to cuss. The little boy said, pull on it in this hot sun a little while longer. It'll come back to you. <laughs> well, well, son, we're not going to do any cussing tonight to try to bring people back to soul winning, but I do believe we need to be reminded. And so that's what we're doing in this, speaking of Jude 122, reminding us that we need to have compassion, make a difference. Take those who are willing to listen and tell them the gospel. So let's follow along just a little bit. First of all, now we're talking about if, if you're going to try to get somebody saved, first of all, you need to understand the gospel yourself. Isn't that true? Understand the gospel completely. What is the gospel anyway? I've had people to say before, well, I surrendered to preach the gospel. Chad surrendered to preach last night. Sunday night. Man, I'm thrilled about that. And sometimes people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm surrendered to preach the gospel. Well, as a pastor, I have to preach more than just the gospel. I'm supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. The gospel is a narrow part. It's the most important part, but it's just one part of the Bible. What is the gospel anyway? People say, well, I, I believe the gospel. Now, what is it? Well, number one, if we look at it in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, it'll tell us, the Bible will tell us exactly what the gospel is. The Apostle Paul wrote it here. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the, the gospel. Okay, so now we've got the subject said. It's the gospel. He said, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand. By, the, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now he's not saying there that, that if you forget what the gospel was, you've lost your salvation. What he's saying is that you can believe in vain. If you believe the wrong message, you believed in vain. If you believe in baptism to get to heaven, you believed the wrong message. Should people, should Christians get baptized? Absolutely they ought to. It is a command. It's not the saving command. Believing the gospel is the saving command. And if you believed in joining a church membership, putting your name on the roll, well, you ought to do that. But that's not what saves you. The gospel is what saves you. And if you believed anything except what he's about to tell us, then you believed in vain. There was a time when I believed in vain. I believed the wrong message. I believed the wrong thing. I had my mind made up. I, knew, I know what it takes to get to heaven. Don't be telling me, preacher. I know what it takes to get to heaven, but I didn't. <laughs> I, was, I was dumb as a box of rocks. It wasn't until a long time after until I heard from the scriptures what the gospel is. And here he tells us in verse number 3, For I delivered unto you, 
First of all, that which I also received, how that, now here it is, here's, here's the gospel, watch this. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So everything about getting saved is according to the scriptures. Everybody's got an opinion on how you ought to get saved. Can I just tell you that it's got to be according to the scriptures. Opinions don't count for anything. And according to the scriptures, the gospel, that saving message that gets a person born again, that gets a person into heaven, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So if anybody ever asks you, what is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection. Why? Why do we have to believe that? Because Jesus died in your place. The reason he died is because you're a sinner and headed to hell without him. And he died, he took your place, he became your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And anytime we try to make something else the object of our faith, besides Christ's death on the cross, we are looking in the wrong direction. Jesus had to die on the cross because he was the sinless one suffering in the place of the guilty sinner. He was the sinless one dying for me. I deserved death. I deserved to go to hell. I didn't deserve heaven. Nobody deserves heaven. We get it because he gives it to us as a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so understanding the gospel means that we have to believe that Jesus died on the cross as our substitute. If we just believe in some Hocus pocus person, even if it's got the name Jesus on it. I'm afraid there are a lot of people that say, yeah, I believe Jesus, but they don't know the Jesus of the Bible. And the Jesus of the Bible died in our place. He became our substitute, died in our place. Then he was buried and he rose again, as we preached about on Sunday. He rose again from the dead. See, if he didn't rise from the dead, then he's still in the grave and you'll never get out of the grave either. But he did die on the cross for our sins and he did come out of that grave that he was buried in. And that's the gospel. Anybody who tries to get saved any other way is barking up the wrong tree. And so if we're going to tell somebody how to be saved, we've got to know what the gospel is. The saving message is the death, burial, and resurrection. Now here's some pointers on if you're going to try to win somebody to the Lord. Let's just say you know somebody you'd like to see get saved. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Could be somebody you work with. But you'd like to see them get saved. Well, here's how you go about it. These are just some practical points to remember. First of all, avoid the extremes when you're witnessing. Too deep or too shallow is both problems. Some people try to go too deep. They'll... If they're going to try to win somebody to the Lord, I've seen people just try to go from Genesis to Revelation. Man, they're just trying to teach the whole Bible in one session. And people are not looking for a lecture. They need to know how to get saved. They need to know the gospel. They don't need to know the whole Bible at that point. Later on, they'll need to know the Bible. But right now, they just need to know how to get saved. And so if we try to go too deep, we're giving them too much knowledge that they can't absorb that quickly. K I S. Yes. <laughs> Keep it simple, simpleton. <laughs> well, and there's, there's truth there. We don't want to make it too complicated. Jesus didn't. Keep it simple. Avoid the extreme of going too deep. And then avoid the, the too shallow thing of telling somebody how to get saved. Just say, Don't say... Uh, Okay, you believe Jesus died for you? Yeah, I believe that. Okay, so pray after me. One, two, three, and we repeat, get them to repeat the prayer. That's way too shallow. They don't understand what the gospel means. So you can go too deep or too shallow to be effective. Avoid the extremes. Sometimes we preach repentance, but sometimes I'm afraid people get into the repentance part way too deep with a lost sinner and they don't even know what we're talking about. I mean, I don't even know what the word means. And repentance is a 
Pretty simple concept, but theologians try to make it difficult. <laughs> repent, the word repent can mean different things in different sections of the Bible. Depends on what subject we're relating it to. Repentance, like you remember the parable where Jesus told the story about the father who told his sons, uh, told one of them, go work in my field, and, told, and he said, no, I'm not going to go. But later he, he repented and went. Okay, that, that's not talking about salvation repentance. That's talking about repenting and going to the field. He said, I'm not going to go work in the field, Dad. And later on he repented and said, okay, I'm going to go work in the field. Well, that's, uh, if somebody is doing wrong, even Christians are doing something wrong, they need to repent. They're doing something wrong. Well, when they repent, they turn from doing wrong and turn to doing right. So the general definition of repentance is turning. It does involve a change of mind. But when we talk about salvation, it's turning from an attachment to sin, which has kept us just from accepting the gospel and following Christ. We love our sin more than we love being saved and so when we turn we are willing to turn our back on sin to receive Christ as Savior. That doesn't mean you have to give up your sin or even be able to confess all your sins. Who can remember all of that? And so we get if we get too deep into telling people about repentance when we just kind of we get them thinking about too many things and it's all going around and around in their head and they can't think of all this stuff. Just talk about turning from sinful living to the Savior. Number two, have a plan. Now, if you're going to win somebody to Christ, avoid the extremes um, and have a plan. I mean, you know, when you confront somebody, and when I'm talking about confronting, I'm not talking about being aggressive or mean-spirited. I'm talking about talking to them about the Lord face-to-face. -face. And when you talk to somebody about the Lord, you need to have a plan. Uh, when I talk about a plan, I'm not talking about a cut-and-dried plan. <laughs> uh, presentation where you got everything memorized and you say one, two, three, four, and you're saved. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about having a plan of how you're going to go about it. How you, you know why most people don't witness to somebody that's lost? They don't know how they're going to go about it, and they're scared because they don't have a plan, don't know what they're going to say. And so we need to, we need to have a general set way of approaching somebody, talk about the Lord. So what's going to be our way? Well, know some verses, first of all. If you're going to win somebody to the Lord, uh, you don't want to have to carry a concordance with you and look up verses in the Bible. So that means we need to know a basic set of verses by heart. At least know where they are in the Bible. And it's better if we got them memorized so we kind of turn the Bible upside down while we're showing them. Like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you point your finger at the verses and you're looking at them and they're reading it, but you're not. You're saying, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And so you're able to quote it without looking down at it and you know it well enough where to find it. So we got a basic set of verses that we know by heart. Romans Road, I've heard good and bad about the Romans Road. It's all Bible. The Romans Road that I know is strictly Bible, so I can't say anything wrong with it. Some people say, well, you just can't get somebody saved by the Romans Road. There are verses out of the Bible. You can take verses out of the Bible and get somebody saved. Uh, what is the Romans Road? It's several verses in the, in the book of Romans that takes you from showing a person how they are a sinner how that sin was passed down to everyone. They were all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Because some people don't think they're sinners. If they're not been in church, they haven't had any Bible study, they don't know they're a sinner, and you've got to show them. God says you're a sinner, for all have come short of the glory. And so we have to show them that they're a sinner. And then that's in Romans. And then also in Romans we show them how Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. And then we show them, and for instance, in Romans 10, 13, 
For, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we know, we have a plan, we know where we're going. See, that's why the devil gets most Christians, I think, where they are afraid to present the gospel or talk to somebody about their soul because they don't know where they're going. If you learn some verses and have a plan about how you're going to go about it, then you're not nearly as afraid because you're not afraid they're going to, they're going to, you're going to get mixed up and not, no, not, not get your tongue tangled up and not know what to say. So have a plan. And then give a clear presentation. How do we give a clear presentation? Well, it depends on exactly how you're going to go about this. Let's say, let's say you're going to talk to a friend or a family member or a co-worker, somebody you're acquainted with. Uh, you would do it a little bit differently than you would if you're just out in the neighborhood and maybe trying to meet some new people on the block and knocking on their door. Uh, if you know people already, you'd say things a little bit differently. And again, this is not a formula that you have to use. Everybody has to be comfortable in their own skin about telling somebody else what the Bible says about getting saved. But I'm just saying if we... If we've got somewhat of an idea how we're going to go about this, it removes a lot of the fear. So here's what we're going to do. If I was going to try to win a friend or a coworker or some acquaintance, family member, uh, over to Jesus, I'd, uh, I'd say something like this. And you can say it any way you want to, but I'd, I'd, I'd try to break the ice by some way just well, here, with old, uh, here with old cousin Jim. Cousin Jim, you know, I've just I've been thinking about heaven. Boy, I, I got things settled a few years ago in my heart from the scriptures about how to get to heaven. Boy, it's brought a lot of peace into my life. Jesus changed my life and all. Cousin Jim, do you ever think about the afterlife? Do you ever think about heaven, God, things like that? You're just talking about a casual conversation, you see. Nod your head. A casual conversation. And you just start talking about heaven maybe there's been a recent funeral you say boy I'm glad I got some things settled with God now I know I'm going to heaven one day when I die I don't have that turmoil in my heart anymore and if you're just relaxed conversation old cousin Jim is going to open up and probably talk a little bit and so depending on what he says you know I just uh, I just let him know that I'm happy now that I've trusted the Lord as my Savior, and I, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. And after you talk a little bit, you can just say, Jim, could I, could I show you in the Bible what somebody loved me enough to show me in the Bible, and I learned what it took to be saved the Bible way? Could I show you the verses that somebody showed me? Man, I'm glad they loved me enough to show me. I want to show you. And then if he says yes... Then go on, show him the verses that you've already thought about in your head. Show him how to get saved the Bible way. Now, if he says no, you may pursue it a little further in a polite way. But if he's very adamant about it and he threatens to slug you in the nose if you don't shut up, then <laughs> I'd probably shut up. But Or you could do like Brother Vineyard, my pastor, when... Uh, when I was in Bible college, he told the story about winning his, Lord, uh, his brother to the Lord in a, in a bar. He said, I've tried every way in the world to get my brother saved, and he never would listen to me. And he said, he'd always brush me off. And he said, I was trying to talk to him one day on the street. We was walking down the street. And he wouldn't listen to me, and he just he went through a door into a bar. He said, I just followed him in there. <laughs> he said, he sat down and ordered a beer. And uh, he said, I, I got to talking to him about the Lord some more. And he said, I just reached in a pocket and pulled out a box of matches. That's, I don't know if they still make matches that way or not. <laughs> but he said, I pulled out a box of matches. And he said, I, just, I told him everything I knew to tell him about getting saved. And he said, I'd pull a match out of that box and I'd strike that match. And he said, I'd just hold it up until it almost burned my fingers and I'd drop it in the ashtray. And I'd take another match out and strike it and let it burn right up to the edge of my fingers and drop it. He said, I went through the whole box of matches. And he said, my brother just sitting there looking at me. He said, what kind of what kind of fool are you? 
He said, well, I'm just trying to get a point across to you. I love you and I want you to get saved. And if you don't get saved, you're going to burn when it's all over. Now, I don't recommend that while you're trying to win somebody to the Lord, but he went to the extreme, I guess. And he loved his brother enough to try to show him, and he said his brother did, in fact, get saved. But if you're talking to somebody you're acquainted with, I would try not to be too formal about it. Just let it be natural conversation. I mean, you talk to the weather, talk up two people about the weather, don't you? Boy, isn't this a nice day? And it is a nice day outside, isn't it? I mean, sun's shining all day. It's in the 70s, I guess. And somebody I was talking to, the, to today about the weather, I, he said, how do you like this weather? I said, man, I wish, I wish it would stay this way all summer long, and then when winter comes, it'd turn off real pretty. <laughs> well, we're just talking about the weather. And when you're talking about the Lord, just be relaxed and talk to your friend or your family member, your acquaintance, just like you would about the weather. Just be relaxed about it. What if you're doing neighborhood visitation? Maybe there's some people on your block and you'd like to meet them and talk to them about the Lord. Well, <coughs> if you were <coughs> knocking on somebody's door you didn't know, first thing I'd do is introduce myself and tell them where I'm from. I'd say, I'm, I'm Rick Brooks. I'm from Liberty Baptist Church and I'm just trying to meet some new people in the neighborhood and see, see where they go to church. And Why would I do that? <coughs> well, First of all, I don't want them to think I'm a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. Uh, I want them to know I'm from the Baptist Church. And uh, because if people know you, if they suspect <coughs> that you're from the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're probably going to hide and not answer the door anyway. So I let them know uh, who I am. <coughs> Sometimes I'll take a funny approach if I'm knocking on a new door. Like <laughs> uh, I've done this a few times. Knock on the new door and say, I'm Rick Brooks. I'm from the IRS. I'm here to talk to you about your income tax. And then laugh real big and smile. I know I'm not. But then they're happy that you're not from the IRS. They talk to, they talk to a Jehovah's Witness now. <laughs> they're glad. I've knocked on a few doors and say, uh, I'm Rick Brooks. I'm a detective with the Searcy Police Department. And uh, we would like to do a little inspection of your house. <laughs> and then when they look at me, they're shocked. They're just kidding, just kidding. I'm not a policeman. <laughs> and uh, I uh, knocked on a door. This is when Brother Paul was, was new. This has been 20 years ago, I guess. I knocked on a new door. Brother Paul was with me. And, and uh, I knocked on the door. And, and somebody hollered through the door and said, Who is it? I said, It's the police. And we heard the commode flush. <laughs> I went through pot. <laughs> well, I don't do that often. Now, one thing I do every once in a while is uh, I knock on the door and they come looking kind of grumpy. I say, I'm Rick Brooks from Liberty Baptist Church. I understand you had invited, uh, invited me to supper this evening. Is that correct? What? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And that makes them relax a little bit. Sometimes, some of them are grumpy and they'll hit you. But No, I'm just joking. They don't hit you. I've never been, never been hit trying to talk to somebody about the Lord. Here's what I'd tell them. We've just got a couple minutes left, so you listen fast, and I'll talk fast. Here's what, here's what I would tell them. After you get through the small talk and you're talking to somebody and you want them to know the Lord, here's what I would do. I would want to convince them that God loves them, first of all. John 3, 16. What does it say? God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. See there, Mr. Jones, God loves everybody. He loved the world. At least at one point, he loved the world enough that Jesus died on the cross. And so I'd convince them that God loves them. I would convince them, number two, not only that God loves them, but I'd convince them that they ought to see what their true condition is. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's other verses, Romans 5, 12, Romans 3, 10. Romans 3.23. Showing God's price for sin. Romans 6.23. Believe that Christ died for you. Romans 5.8. Confess your faith in Christ. John 3.7. Romans 10.9 through 13. After you've talked to them for a while and they have heard the gospel and you believe they're interested... 
If they're just trying to brush you off, I would probably bid them a farewell and invite them to church. But if they're real interested and you know that, hey, I think this person really wants to get saved. And at that point, I would uh, try to lead them to the place where they're ready to receive the Lord. Again, no arm twisting, no salesmanship, no coercion, but ask. You know why we have an invitation after a church service? To ask if somebody's got a decision they need to make. After I end a sermon, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you like to come and receive Christ as your Savior? It's called an invitation. Would you? And maybe you've been saved and never baptized. Would you come? Would you? Maybe you're a Christian and there's some decision you need to make in following the Lord. Would you come? Giving an invitation. Because if the Holy Spirit has worked on them, they don't know what to do next. And you say, would you be willing to trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Would you place your trust in Him? And if so, then you could pray with them right there and then. Uh, how do we prepare to share the gospel anyway? Well, we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You, just, you can't beat the gospel into anybody, but you can find people who are willing like the like the, uh, the uh, jailer at Philippi, he was ready to be saved. So here's how I would conclude our lesson tonight. To witness to somebody is not just talking religion. To witness to somebody is not talking theology. I mean, that could go on for ages and somebody would never get saved. It's focusing upon the gospel, what it takes to be saved. Showing somebody a simple way. Now, we went over several things here, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Do you know how you got saved? Did you get saved? I'm asking people are watching online. I ask you, do you, do you, are you saved, and do you know how you got saved? If you know that one day you realized that you were a sinner, and you were told how the gospel works, that Jesus died in your place, and you... Trusted in Him as your Savior because of what He did on the cross for you. Then you know how you got saved. If you didn't do that, if you didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and because He sacrificed Himself on the cross for you, then friend, I, I humbly but not apologetically tell you that you're not saved. Jesus said you must be born again. You must be born again. Jesus didn't instruct us that there were different ways to get to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. If he was telling the truth, then he's the only way to be saved. And if he's not telling the truth, then there is no way to get saved. <laughs> it's either Jesus or nothing. I believe Jesus. Jesus. And so when we approach somebody to tell them about our faith, we need to just simply remember, instead of making it a complicated thing, simply remember how you got saved. You believed the Bible that said you're a sinner. You believed the Bible that says you must be born again. You placed your trust in Christ and he saved you. It's that simple. If somebody believes. There is no magic in saying a prayer. And that's why we don't try to coerce somebody into saying a prayer, one, two, three, repeat after me, because that won't save anybody. It has to be a heartfelt move. I'm gonna, I don't want to go to hell. I'm placing my faith in Christ. That's how somebody gets saved. Genuine trust, believing on Christ. And that's how we lead somebody to trust Christ. We can't save them, but we can give them the gospel and invite them to receive Jesus. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. I'm challenging our church. Let's get back to winning people, not just to our church. That's one way to get them under the gospel. Win them to yourself, win them to the church, but winning them to Jesus is the best of all. Seeing them Hear the gospel and trust Christ. Would you help me see if we can get people saved? That's our mission work for Cersei, Arkansas. Let's pray together.
Father, we pray that you'd bless the message tonight, bless the scriptures. Lord, use it, those scriptures. Use the truth of them to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, we don't want to see anybody go to hell. We want to see people saved. And Lord, if you would inspire us in our heart just to tell others, oh Lord, we'd be willing to go, we'd be willing to tell, we'd be willing to help others to come to you. Lord, we understand we can't save anybody, but you can, and we can tell them to whom they should go. I pray that you'd bless the invitation. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I